Hello, everyone, and welcome to another exciting seminar in our series. Uh, my name is Julia Dalti. I'm a postdoc in Judith Mang's lab at the University of British Columbia. And before I introduce today's speaker, I just have a couple of quick announcements to make. Um, first, I want to remind everyone that, as always, there will be a Q&A session after the talk. If you would like to post questions for the speaker, you can do so in our Slack channel, where you can also upvote with a thumbs up the questions that you would like to see answered. Um, second, as many of you may be aware, uh, this coming weekend, the clocks go back by one hour in most European countries, uh, which means that for next week's seminar only, uh, the talk will begin one hour earlier, uh, only in the countries that change clocks this weekend. After that, we come back to the, the normal schedule and we will also send out a tweet reminder uh, before the seminar next week. Uh, with that, it is a, a pleasure to have with us Professor Abdou Kila, uh, CNRS Research Director and Head of the Evolutionary and Developmental Genomics Team at the Institute of Functional Genomics of Lyon in France. Uh, Abdou obtained his bachelor's degree in biology at Fez University in Morocco. He then completed his PhD in joint supervision between Fez University and the Paul Sabatier University in France. Uh, following that, he held a series of postdoctoral fellowships at the University of Western Ontario and at McGill University in Canada before opening his own research group in Lyon. Uh, Abdu's research focuses on understanding the molecular and adaptive mechanisms underlying species diversification. Uh, his work studies semi-aquatic insects, uh, which includes water striders and their relatives, by integrating genomics, transcriptomics, proteomics, as well as evolutionary ecology and developmental genetics to study the evolution of exaggerated sexually selected traits, the dynamics of sexual conflict, and the origin of novel traits in this group of organisms. Uh, his talk today is entitled Phenotypic Evolution in Water Striders and Evo Devo Perspective. So thank you very much, Abdu, for accepting our invitation and over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Yulia. Um, I am very um, excited to speak in this series. Um, thank you and the organizers for the invitation. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about what we have been doing in the lab, um, uh, trying to understand um, some general principles and mechanisms of how phenotypes evolve um, in a group uh, of insects that have a, a particular uh, lifestyle. So what we try to do in the lab is we try to integrate different fields to understand how diversity arises in nature. So one of the ways this type of questions are studied in the field is through EvoDevo, which is um, a field that tries to connect the genotype to the phenotype and how the genotype can actually shape the phenotype during development but also how changes in this relationship through time can explain um, diversity and, and phenotypic evolution. On the other hand, we can ask the same question by connecting the phenotype to its selective environment. And this would be um, asking why certain phenotypes, for example, are more um, favored by selection than others. So we do this in a group of insects called the uh, Geromorpha or um, semi-aquatic insects. This is a, a quite highly diverse group and we know um, of more than 2000 spe species that are um, um, spread uh, worldwide. These are animals that have made the transition from life on terrestrial habitats to life on the water air interface. And you can find them in any kind of water surface habitat. Some of them actually specialize in these small reservoirs of bromeliad uh, plants. Uh, there are some species who specialize in, in the open ocean and you will find them hundreds of kilometers away from the shore, but they also have occupied all kinds of habitats in between these, these two. And you'll find them in ponds and streams and rivers and lakes and mangroves. Etc. So there is a, a quite large diversity of these insects that have occupied these, these types of niches. So why did we get interested in these, in these animals? So 
one of the first attractive aspects is that this group has been attracted, uh, attracting attention for quite a long time from, from scientists. So there's a, um, a lot of information and a lot of studies uh, of their biology, of their phylogeny, of sexual selection. So they are pretty prim prominent model for studies of sexual selection and sexual conflict. There's even some interest by the biomechanics community who tries to understand how these animals can maintain their body weight on the water surface and how they can generate movement on the water surface. So there is quite a rich foundation in terms of, of life history and biology that is already existing that we could build on to start to ask questions from a developmental genetics perspective. So what we've done is we brought these, these insects to, to the lab and we um, optimized their rearing and we have now multiple species breeding in the lab and we can have access to biological materials all year round, which is very important if we, if we want to do experiments on these animals. So another reason why uh, we are interested in studying these animals is because there's a, a, a quite a rich variety of conspicuous phenotypes that either we know are adaptive or we at least suspect are adaptive. And they actually allow us to ask a number of important biological questions uh, by using these, these animals as, as study models. So there are um, uh, many phenotypes that have to do with locomotion on the water surface. And we are going to talk a little bit more about this. Uh, phenotypes that have to do with the interaction with predators and, and other um, kind of, uh, of organisms. As I said, there are um, a nice model to study sexual conflicts, and unfortunately, we are not going to touch this uh, uh, today. Um, phenotypic plasticity, this is something I will talk a little bit more about if I, if I have some time left. There are even phenotypes, so these are eggs of, of different species of water striders. So there are phenotypes where you can actually study um, pigmentation and, and mimicry in this group. So there is um, a richness in terms of phenotypes we can actually use to ask questions about phenotypic evolution in, in this group. So one of the first stories I want to tell you about this is this transition to life on the water surface. And the way you can look at it is that in this, in this group of animals, there are two main uh, events or key events that um, I would explain in this very simplified phylogeny. So the first would be this uh, first uh, event of, of water surface invasion, which all these animals can actually can actually do. But then upon this, this uh, first event, there was a, a burst of diversification and specialization and also um, uh, divergence in terms of phenotypes. And that's what we would call here a, a, a kind of a diversification of the group. So this is in comparison, for example, to this um, terrestrial species, which is another heteropteran. So these kind of, of, uh, um, of life history can allow us to ask questions associated with how animals can um, acquire new uh, uh, ecological habitat and how can they can adapt to it and how after this acquisition, they can actually burst into diversification what kind of genetics changes, what kind of phenotypic changes are associated with, this, with these events. So if you look at these animals here, you will notice two different things. So you have species like this green species called Mesovilia, which has a body plan that resembles terrestrial species, especially when it comes to um, relative leg length. So the first legs are shorter than the second, that which are shorter than the third. When you go to more derived species like these ones, we have a, a change in the, in the body plan. And these two body plans have a, a, a tight connection to the way or to their behavior or how they, they generate locomotion on the water surface. So species like this would be a walking species. So they would use what we call a tripod gait. So they would just alternate like movements like terrestrial insects do, or you and I uh, do with our two legs. Whereas species like these ones here, they would use what we call a rowing gait. And this rowing gait is tightly associated with the fact that the second leg, which you see here, is the longest, which is not typical for, for insects. And this is because the second legs act as, as, uh, as, as, uh, um, as paddles. 
and that they move simultaneously to generate movement, which are the only uh, or the most uh, important legs for generating movement. So these two modes of locomotion, of locomotion are, are fundamentally different, and they are associated with differences in the shape of the animal and the size of the leg of the animal. So one of the questions we wanted to ask is how do we transit from this kind of body plan to this kind of body plan from a developmental perspective? Um, well, first of all, before I go to there, we mapped these two um, morphologies and behaviors in the phylogeny. And that's what you see here in this phylogeny. In red is all species that use rowing as a mode of locomotion. And in black, are all species that use walking as a mode of locomotion. And what we uh, realized, in fact, is that it seems that there is one gain of this, of this uh, morphology and behavior, which became uh, the most represented in the phylogeny. And after this gain, there were four independent reversals uh, back to the, to the ancestral state, which is second leg shorter than the third leg and walking. As, as, a, as a mode of locomotion. So here we started to ask, well, how do you accomplish this? And, uh, and, and why is it so important? And we wanted to know what actually makes this morphology different from this morphology in terms of development and in terms of, of function of these, of these, uh, of these uh, phenotypes. So the first entry to this is we went to uh, a kind of a, a candidate gene approach or a, a educated guess approach. So there was a gene that called UBX, which is a Hox gene that was known in terrestrial insects to be expressed. So this would be the adult and this is an embryo. The gene is expressed only in the third leg here and it's absent from the two other legs. And its role is to make this leg longer than the two others. And we made a certain number of hypotheses based on this. One of the hypotheses is that this species here, Mesovilia, since it looks like a terrestrial insect in terms of uh, relative leg length, it should have the same pattern of expression and the same function of the gene. And this would be different in this species where the second leg is now much longer. But to our surprise, when we looked for the pattern of expression in this gene in Mesovilia, what we found is that we have two domains or two legs that express the gene, even though there has, no, has not been a, a major change in morphology. And the other surprise is that between these two species, where there is um, a fundamental difference in the body plan, especially in the size of the second leg, we don't have much of a difference in terms of gene expression when we look at the, at the protein level. So looks like there is a spatial difference in terms of gene expression between all species that can walk on water and terrestrial species, but it doesn't seem like there is much difference between species that can walk on water among themselves. So we started looking closer, and then we realized that, in fact, the timing of expression of this gene is very important for this morphology. So if you look at Mesovilia, here you have an early embryo, and here you have an older embryo, and it turns out in the early embryo, the gene is expressed only in the, in the third leg, and it's absent from the second, and later on, the second leg joins in expressing this protein. And the situation is completely opposite in, in Jerry's, which has the second leg being, being longer. So here, the second leg is first to express the gene, and then the third leg joins later. So it seems like this leg where the gene or the protein spend mo spends most of the time is the one that is going to grow more, and it's going to shape how the adult will look uh, later. Another important aspect is uh, on top of gene expression is gene function. And we can actually study gene function by specifically inactivating or depleting the gene and looking at what happens to the phenotype after that. So here again, Oncopeltis, it has UBX only in the third leg and when it's inactivated, so in this graph here, the white is, is control and the gray is the RNAi knockdown and this is the size of the leg. So the second leg doesn't express the gene and it's not affected, which makes sense. The third leg expresses the gene and when it's inactivated, it becomes shorter. So here in, in Mesovilia, both legs express the gene. And in both legs, when we inactivate the gene, both of them become, become shorter, except in the third leg, the effect is much more dramatic. Whereas in the second leg, it's very subtle. It's almost 
15% of the size of the leg is lost. Another big surprise is in Jerry's here, where when we inactivate the gene, the second leg becomes actually sh shorter, which is the same as the other species, but the third leg becomes longer. So here it seems like on top of the spatial expression and the timing of expression, the effect of the gene on the tissue is opposite. So here in this species, the gene makes the second leg longer and makes sure that the third leg is shorter than the second. And that's how we get this morphology here, which is appropriate for rowing as opposed to walking. So to recapitulate this, if you look here again in this simplified phylogeny, we have a terrestrial insect that we use to compare. The ancestral state is just one leg expressing the gene, and the role of this gene is to make the leg longer, and that's why it's in green. So at the base of all semi-aquatic insects, we have a gain of a new expression in an additional leg, and we have a difference in dose, so one leg expresses much more of the protein than the other, and species that um, have uh, um, the, this, this walking um, morphology, second leg being shorter than the third, the gene is just makes the leg longer. The more protein we have, the longer the leg is, and the earlier the protein is expressed, the longer the leg is. And when we inactivate it, we shorten those legs. But then in this species where the body plan reversed, and now we have second legs that are shorter than, than the third, we have not much change in terms of those of and spatial expression, but we have a change in, in the effect of the gene. In the second leg, there is a lot of the protein, and that's what you see here, but then it makes the leg shorter. And in the, in, in, sorry, in the third leg, there's a lot of the protein and it makes the third leg shorter. And in the second leg, there is less of the protein, and this has a, a positive effect on how the leg will, will grow. So there is a dose-dependent um, effect of the leg. And that's how these differences in morphology are shaped throughout the evolution of these species. So one of the other questions we ask is how the same gene can do opposite things into adjacent segments in the same animal. And that's um, a kind of a dose-dependent effect of this, of this gene. So the way we did that is we did a comparative transcriptomics approach where we sequenced the second and the third leg of uh, 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 one of the species, second leg being long, third leg being, being short, and then we looked at genes that are differentially expressed between these two legs. Uh, one of the genes that came up is a gene called GILT, which is a protein known for its effect or for its function in, in, in adaptive immunity in mammals, so we were very surprised to see it. When you actually look in the embryo, so this would be transcriptomic data, and this would be the expression pattern in the embryo of this species, and you can see that the gene is exclusively expressed in the tip of the second leg and it's absent from the other legs. Then when we look at the number in our transcriptome, what we realize is that in red, in the second leg, there's very little UVX and then guilt is, is expressed. In the third leg where there is a high dose of UVX, guilt is repressed or absent. And what to test, did, to test this, what we did is actually, we inactivated UVX in the embryos and we asked what happens now to guilt. And that's what you see here in this embryo. When we, not, we inactivate UBX, we get two things. The first thing is we get UBX now to pop up in the, in the third leg where it is not supposed to be expressed. And the second thing which you don't see in this because it's not quantitative, but we know this from, from quantitative analysis, is that guilt also increases in the second leg. So what this means is that UBX which is expressed in high dose in the third leg, this high dose represses completely a target gene called guilt. And in the second leg, since UBX is expressed in low dose, it allows some expression of this, of this protein. And this is how transcription factors can modulate how much growth will happen in the leg and ultimately how the animal is going to, to look uh, when it becomes an adult. So we ask also, what does guilt itself do? So we, when we inactivate guilt, you can see the effect in, the, in this comparative uh, uh, pictures. So this would be a control embryo. The second leg, which is the longest, it starts here and goes all the way to the back of the embryo here until the head. And here I am highlighting the tarsus, which is the part of the leg with, where guilt is expressed. 
When we inactivate guilt, you see that the embryo is completely normal. And the only difference is that the tarsus of the second leg is significantly shorter. So guilt increases the size or the growth of the tarsus and UBX comes to regulate how much of that is going to happen by regulating how much guilt of guilt is going to be expressed. So another question we ask is that now, how did this happen throughout the phylogeny of this group? So if you look at this phylogeny here, we have three species, all of which have second legs that are shorter than the third. All of these species walk, and uh, because they have the walking walking uh, morphology, and we compare them to this group of species from uh, a family called the Geridae, and all of these species have second legs that are longer than the third, and you will find this guilt expression only in this group of species. And what we conclude concluded from this is that at this node of the phylogeny, we have this new interaction here between UBX and guilt that shapes and modifies how the legs will grow and whether the second leg is going to become longer than the third. So this allows us to trace during the phylogeny these changes in terms of gene expression, gene function, and gene interaction, and how that translates into shaping the morphology and also the behavior of, of these species. So why are these phenotypes relevant? So I told you earlier, so now we talked mostly about this part here during development, how the genotype can, can shape the phenotype. So now why, why are they relevant? What does it actually serve uh, the organism in its natural habitat? So to do this, we had a certain number of, uh, of hypotheses. And one of, one of the hypotheses is that the size of the legs is very important if the animal is to generate movement on a substrate that is fluid, that actually is, is very difficult from um, a solid substrate where there is friction and all leg movements are translated in, into, into locomotion. Whereas in a fluid substrate, uh, the substrate is moving back away from the animal and the animal has to row in, in a kind of a moving, a moving uh, substrate. So to do this, we hypothesize that locomotion on water will require that animals will be significantly faster to be able to cope with this, with this fluid, fluid dynamics. So we tested this and one of the ways we tested this is we wanted to see if um, having longer legs translates into generating um, faster locomotion. So you see that here, this is a, a correlation. So in this axis is the speed of the animal as measured by body lengths per second, but the same is true for uh, centimeters per second, for example. And here is the size of the second leg, which is the leg that is now expressing UBX and getting longer compared to ter terrestrial animals. So the color code here, all animals in red are the ones that row with this um, type of behavior. The blue animals are the ones that walk. The green animals are actually um, semi-aquatic insects that reversed back from rowing to walking as I showed you earlier in that phylogeny. And then the, the the black dots are terrestrial uh, insects. And you can see that there is a tight correlation between the size of the second leg and the speed of locomotion that these animals can generate on the water surface. Another way of looking at this is by looking at stroke frequency. And this basically gives you an idea of how much work and how much energy the animal is going to spend to generate whatever locomotion or whatever speed is going to generate. And what you see here is that in animals that have this mode of locomotion here, rowing, they can generate quite high speed by actually doing very, very few strokes per unit of time. Whereas animals that do the walking mode of locomotion, they will uh, generate high speed all right, but they will need to do a lot of strokes per unit of time to generate that speed. This is very important because this gives us a good idea about how each of these animals specializes in 
the particular niche that they occupy in water surface um, uh, areas. So you think about water surface as probably uniform um, habitat, but in fact, it's extremely diverse habitat. And animals like these ones here that do rowing, uh, sorry, that do walking, usually they are going to be associated with marginal um, uh, niches. They would be comfortable going to the ground and go into the water. And most of the time, you'll find them spending most of their time on water lilies and floating objects. And they will only go full speed if they are crossing from one object to the other, because there are fish usually waiting for them to cross to, be, uh, to try to, to catch them. Whereas animals like these ones here, they are on open water. So rowing animals usually occupy open water zone. They are exposed. They actually have to be moving uh, most of the time and they have also to be uh, very, very fast. And you can imagine that this mode of locomotion, if the animal can generate fast speed with very few strokes per unit of time, they can actually sustain um, uh, a lot of movement, fast movement without spending too much, too much energy. So this is most likely associated with what kind of niche each animal is occupying. Another important aspect also is the interaction, for example, with predators. Uh, what you see in this video, this is a very typical uh, strategy for water striders to escape predation. So animals that are on open, open water, they are most of the time attacked from underneath, either by fish or by water scorpions or other, other uh, aquatic predators. And they have this very um, striking jump that they tend to generate mostly by their second legs. So you can imagine that the shape and the size of the second legs has to be optimal enough for the animal to generate a, a, an optimal jump and to remove its body from the trajectory of the mouth of the, of the predator. So you'll see this and it's very easy to reproduce in lab conditions. So to test this, we did uh, one experiment we did is that we generated animals by using this gilt RNAi uh, technique. Since gilt is a gene that contributes to growing the legs, but it's not an essential gene. So uh, animals where we knock down this gene can survive, can actually uh, grow until adults, and they have no problem except that their legs are about 20% shorter than a control animal. And we made this predation setup where you have a predator approaching the animal from underneath, and then the animal triggers the jump, and we measure um, the performance of the animal. And the performance of the jump is a reflection of the acceleration and, uh, and the, um, the power of the jump that the animal can produce. And it gives us a sort of a proxy of how good is the animal in, in escaping predation and probably how fit is the animal uh, going to be if faced with predators. And what you can see here is that when they have 20% shorter legs, that translates into a significant reduction in the performance of uh, in, this, in this predation setup. So here I'm not putting details, but all sample sizes and details are in this, in this paper if, if you are interested in, in, in looking in more, in more detail. So another story I want to talk to you about today is, I, I mentioned earlier that after this uh, transition to this new adaptive zone, if you will, or this new habitat, there was a burst of diversification and a number of striking phenotypes also evolved that are in relation with this, with this locomotion on, on fluid substrate. One of them is about evolutionary innovations. And I'm going to show you an example here. Here you see a water strider trying to uh, jump, uh, uh, sorry, trying to climb um, uh, quite a, a, a water current here. And they do that by using a structure that we call a propelling fan that you see here. So if you compare these two, these two animals, Ragovilia with Stridulovilia, so these are sympatric animals that you will find in the tropics. They will live in the same stream, except that this species here will be in the middle of the stream where water current is quite, is quite strong and it's on permanent movement. Whereas this species here is always in the margin, always on, on, on aquatic plants, etc. So this one has this fan at the tip of, this second, of their second legs. So the second leg are the driving legs, are the ones that generate locomotion. This one does not have a fan. It has a typical or uh, standard uh, insect leg with, with claws at the tip. 
So when you look, both of these animals employ rowing as a mode of locomotion, but they have these, these morphological differences with presence and absence of fangs. When you look closer at the fan, so if you take it out of the leg and you zoom on it, so you have these two big claws that you see here, and then the fan is, the fan is this, this very well-structured system with this uh, plume-like structure. There are about 20 of them. And they have these primary branches and then secondary, secondary branches. They almost look like, uh, like uh, uh, bird feathers. The animal can deploy it or retract it according to what kind of behavior it's, it's doing. And I'll show you some videos later. So one of the big questions of, in the field is where do these evolutionary innovation come from? What genes are, are, are building them? And how do they uh, emerge in, in evolution? So we started this project by asking, can we find genes that will explain the development of this structure? And what we did, so this was a work done by Emilia Santos, who's a, a former postdoc in the lab. So what Emilia did is she took uh, these animals, she extracted the legs at the right developmental stage, and she sequenced the first, the second, and the third leg which you see here in this, in this heat map. And she was interested in detecting transcripts that are enriched in the second legs. And the second legs are the only, one, the only ones that have the fan, with the hypothesis that those transcripts might be uh, associated with, development, with the development of the fan. So Emilia got about 100 transcripts that show this pattern. They are low in the first leg and in the third leg, and they are high in the second leg. And then she um, actually did a, a functional screen on in situ hybridization screen to lower this list from 100 to about five or six transcripts. So basically she took all these genes, she made probes and she, she stained the embryos to see which ones are going to be expressed only in the tip of the leg to, uh, to associate them with the development of the fan. So to our surprise, Five of these transcripts show this pattern of expression. So here, this is just a piece of an embryo. This is the first leg, the second leg, and the third leg. And you can see here with this dark dot, that's the pattern of expression that is identical for all these five or six transcripts. So this is interesting because not only these are expressed in this, the right leg, but they are also expressed in the right spot in the leg. That's where we expect or we uh, would expect the, the, the cells that make uh, this, this structure. So, so one of the questions Emilia was asking uh, is, what is the nature of this transcript? What is this function? So she looked at them and turns out some of them were uh, known proteins that are cuticular proteins. One of them was a gene called yellow, which is part of a, a pigment pathway that makes melanin, uh, which is very well studied in, in many insects. But what attracted our attention is two transcripts that were unknown. <coughs> Sorry. These two transcripts were extremely similar, very similar in terms of sequence, but they were obviously different transcripts. So what Emilia did, she took a sample of species, and here in this group are species that don't have fans. So these are, these are all water striders, those ones without fan, and she took three Ragovilla species here, all of them have fans. So the Ragovilla genus, there's approximately 400 known species, and without any exception, all of them have fans. And the fan doesn't exist anywhere else outside this, this group. So she wanted to see, <coughs> sorry, where these two transcripts would map. And what she found is that there are two copies of these transcripts. One copy is common to all species, whether they have the fan, or whether they don't have the fan. She called that the A copy. And one copy, the B copy, occurs only in Ragovilla, which, which are the species with the fan. So it turns out this, these are two duplicates of the same, of the same gene. One duplicate uh, or one copy is common to all water striders, and one duplicate is exclusive to the species with the fan. So here we concluded that we have two main developmental changes, if you will, or genetic changes. One of them is this regulation that you see in the tip of the leg. The leg. 
This regulation with the sedating species without the fan and genes are not expressed there. And then the second event is this gene duplication that both coincide with the evolution of the fan. So that was kind of a smoking gun for us. So we went ahead and we looked at the function of this. <clears throat> Sorry, before I go there, we wanted to find a name for these, for these genes since they were unknown. So we called them the, the new copy, we called it Geisha, which is in analogy to these Geisha fans that you see in this picture here. And the older copy, we called it Mother of Geisha. So this is how we, we call these genes now. So we wanted to see what these two genes do. Unfortunately, with our technical um, setup, with our experimental setup, we cannot discriminate these two genes in our inactivation setup. So the experiments are showing you here are the result of both genes being inactivated at the same time. So this would be controlled fan, and this would be a fan of an individual where we treated uh, uh, with RNAi against geisha and mother of geisha. What was really striking to us is that the claws, which you see here, which are part of the complex that makes the fan, are completely normal. They are not affected at all. But the fan itself is heavily depleted, so we lose most of the branches, and we completely lose all the secondary, those small branches for the fan. This was um, extremely surprising to us. The animals do completely fine, find out they are alive, they go until adulthood, but they just don't have, or they just have rudimentary pieces of the fan instead of having a complete, a complete fan. So if you look now uh, how these animals behave, so here you see uh, a normal animal, this would have a fan that is completely formed, and this would be a geisha, mother of geisha, RNAi animal. So these are high speed camera videos. So this is very, very slowed down. What you will see in these, in these videos here is that, let me see if I can stop it at a time where, where we can see. So here, for example, you see the shadow in the tip of the leg. That's the fan being deployed by the animal. The animal only deploys it when it's like is pushing against the water, so the water, and then it retracts it back. So here you see the animal deploying what's left, but all you see is these two pieces of tissue coming out. Those are the two claws, basically. There is no fan. This is surprising because it means that these genes make the fan or help make the fan, but nothing else. The muscles that control the complex, the nervous system that con controls complex seems to be fine because the animal is able to deploy whatever it is left, but it just doesn't have a fan left. So one of the other questions that um, we asked is, what is exactly the role of the fan in natural setup? So the fan is known, very well known by taxonomists and it's usually described as a speed increasing uh, structure, if you will. So if you go to the field, so here you have uh, uh, videos um, from, um, from the field. So these are normal, these are videos taken by uh, uh, basically cell phone camera. And you see that here you have ragovilia. They, they are always in permanent movement. They don't stop and they are always in the middle of the stream. So this is their normal lifestyle. This is Stridulovilia, which is the sympatric species. And this um, uh, species basically is always standing on um, pieces of, of floating object. So this particular video is in the lab and this has, these are uh, plastic plants. And you see individuals are always static. They shake and we think they shake because they are trying to fake that they are part of the plant or something like that. And they will only move and they're extremely fast if they want to go from point A to point B, otherwise they are most of the time static. So these are two completely different behaviors that are associated with completely different niches in, in these water, water habitats. So we wanted to know what does the fan add to the animal? So to do this, what we did is we generated four groups of, of individuals. Um, the first group is this 
Stridovilia species, the one that specializes in the margin and that naturally does not have any fan. Then we have normal Ragovilia individuals with completely uh, formed fans. Then we have a number of individuals where we surgically remove the fans. We left the claws and we just took out the fan. They are very easy to take out. You just bend them with the forceps and you just break because they are uh, mostly keratin uh, based um, uh, structures. And then we have a, a, a last group where we have rudimentary fan, just reduced fan. So these are not, the fan is not completely absent, but it's not as good as, as a complete fan. And those we generated with um, geisha and the mother of geisha RNAi. And what we did, we took these animals and we um, tested them in a calm water setup. This would be the setup or the environment where the species without the fan normally lives in the wild. And to our surprise, what we found, we measured speed and other locomotion parameters. And what we found is that Stridolivilia, which is the species without the fan, is the fastest in this setup. So this goes against the idea that the fan is there to increase speed. So Ragovilia are not necessarily faster in calm water. In fact, all the three Ragovilia groups, they have the same or almost the same speed, regardless of what is the status of the fan. Things start to become slightly more clear when we started to look at stroke frequency. And again, this is how much effort the animal makes to generate the speed they generate. So Stridovilia is the fastest, and uh, it's also because it's the one that moves with the highest number of strokes per unit of time. So it's working really hard to generate this speed. In Ragovilia, animals with full fans, they generate very few, uh, uh, they generate the speed they generate with very few strokes per unit of time. The animals without fan, where we surgically remove the fan, they have to compensate for the lack of the fan by making many strokes per unit of time. And the animals with um, pieces of the fan are intermediate between presence and absence of the fan. So it seems like with this setup, having pieces of the fan is better than not having a fan at all. So next, what we did, now we challenged these animals with a stream. So the stream setup would be the environment where Ragovilia would specialize. And the way we did this is by putting two buckets. Between the buckets, there is a canal. And we have a pump. And then by um, changing the, tilting the angle of the canal, we can change the speed of water. And we can measure the speed of water. And we have a platform from a, a constant distance from either the upstream, uh, the, uh, the upstream bucket, which we call the winner bucket, and the downstream bucket, which we call the loser bucket. So the animal would jump from this, from this uh, platform to the water for some reason. And don't ask me why. These animals, as soon as they feel there is a current, they swim immediately against it, and they go upstream. So then we can measure how many make it to the winner bucket, how many will be taken by the current to the loser bucket, and those who make it, how much time it took them to make it. So the setup is like this. So this is in high speed camera video. So you see here a few individuals swimming against the current. And now this is normal videos. Up is, is untreated animals or controls, and down is geisha animals. You see there is a, an individual just, just zipped and here you have an animal with re reduced fans, which is having a hard time, but it's still going against, against the current. So this video is very long, so I'm, I'm going to shorten it a little bit. And I'm going to show you, this is a second normal animal, and this is the same animal trying, struggling to go up and down against this current. So you'll have a second uh, normal animal. It zips through the current, and this guy keeps going up and down, and eventually, after 10 minutes or so, it gets exhausted, and it falls into the loser bucket. So this is more of a visual way of showing you the, the result. Now we quantify this. <coughs> Sorry. Now again, here are all four groups of animals that we, that we, um, we generated. And here, the big surprise, again, is this species, Stridolovilia. This is the one that's the fastest in, in calm water. 
as soon as you give them current, they can't cope with it. So 0%, the numbers here is the percentage of animals that made it to the winner bucket. None of them were able to make it. Raguvilia, the individuals with completely formed fan, they all made it, and they made it in approximately 15 seconds in that distance we gave them. Now the animals, these ones, without fan, that we surgically removed the fan, only 40% of them made it. And those who made it, it took them almost um, uh, 90 seconds to make it to the, to the winner bucket. And again, the animals where the fan is reduced, this group here, they um, almost 90% uh, of them made it, and they made it in approximately 30 seconds. So it's, again, they are intermediate between the ones with complete fans and the ones with, with reduced fans. So what this means is that this evolutionary innovation may have evolved not to necessarily increase speed, but to um, allow these animals to exploit this niche, which is very challenging, other species can't access it, but to allow them to maintain or to sustain a full movement lifestyle that allows them to actually keep themselves balanced in this, in this challenging, uh, fast flowing, flowing waters. So they don't necessarily increase, it doesn't necessarily increase speed, but it increases sustainability of, uh, of movement in a challenging, challenging environment. The fact that this one is always intermediate between presence and absence of fan probably means also that throughout evolution, you might have any rudiment in the leg that might actually um, give some advantage to, to these animals. And as time goes and generations goes, these rudiments become perfected until they uh, form this, this perfect looking uh, uh, device that allows these animals to exploit new, new ecological habitat. So with this part, I, just the take home message here, I showed you the first part where we have genes like UBX and guilt, which are genes that are very, very conserved. Um, guilt, for example, you find it in yeast, in fungi, and in humans. And these are genes that have been there all the time, but they have not been talking to each other. So you have new interactions that can form between old proteins or old genes. And these new interactions might actually create or uh, uh, help evolve new morphologies and new phenotypes that um, uh, allow certain organisms to adapt and to acquire new ecological niches and, and lifestyles. In the second example, I showed you the opposite, which is completely new genes here by, by gene duplication can actually make new things or new phenotypes that um, ancestors of, this, of these lineages didn't have. And these new phenotypes will allow the will allow these lineages to acquire new lifestyles and to, uh, uh, to uh, acquire new habitats and new ecological opportunities. And this is part of how probably lineages diversify and occupy, occupy new niches. So if I have some time, I don't know, Yulia, if I still have some time. Yulia? Um. I think so. We have about 10 more minutes left of the entire seminar session, um, depending and on the question you. part. <laughs> yeah. OK, so I'll, I'll probably try to take five minutes very quickly sure. to talk to you about um, um, a, a, a phenotype that has to do with trait exaggeration. So this is um, so I'll, I'll probably quickly explain how these phenotypes are widespread. They usually scale uh, disproportionately to body size. So here's an example of the horn beetles, for example, where you see the horns, which have this slope coefficient of, of uh, uh, above one, which make them hyperlometric. And we're studying this question in a species of water striders called Microvilia longipes, which you see here, this is a male, this is a female, this is a small male, the small male, all these individuals are adults, so they are done uh, growing. And you can see this male is massively bigger, especially the legs are massively longer than, than this one here. So to try to understand this, we took a similar approach to what, to what I showed you. So a combination of studies of behavior to try to understand what's the, uh, um, what's the function of this phenotype and also comparative transcriptomics and genomics and gene uh, expression and gene function. So I'll try to show you very quickly um, 
why this phenotype is, is important for this species. You'll see that in, in this video here. So basically what happens is that in this species, males are very territorial. They try to find, or they tend to find these small floating objects. They guard them, they get challenged by other males and they fight and the male who dominates will sit on this object, females will come, inspect the object and if they like it, they will mate, they will copulate with the male immediately and they will lay a bunch of eggs. And then you can imagine a male that manages to dominate the object for a long, long period of time will have the opportunity to, to fertilize most of, these, most of these eggs here. So here there's a male calling. So the calls happen by generating these small ripples on the water surface. Sometimes other males come to take the object away and then they fight with the long legs and then the dominating male will stay and a female will come in. So we tested this and what we realized is that every time there is a fight, almost invariably um, the bigger male is the one who's going to win. So you can imagine that this size of the leg is probably under strong sexual selection for, for dominating males. But the phenotype is highly variable between males. So there are small males and big males. And you can imagine how can you uh, uh, maintain such variation if selection is really strong in favor of, of long males. So one test we did is we wanted to know, is it true that the eggs that actually the females lay in these egg laying sites are always fertilized by the dominating males? And we did this in two setups that you see in this graph. In this graph, in one condition, we have only three floaters for 12 males. Six of them are big and six of them are small. And this means that there will be high competition for these egg laying sites. And here in this condition, we have 12, 20 floaters for 12 males. So here, that means that there is very low competition for these egg laying sites. And what we, uh, we did, we genotyped the eggs. We know the genotype of the males and we actually determined paternity for which male fertilized which egg. And we could actually tell that in this condition here, when competition is high, the big males fertilize the extreme majority of eggs, which means a dominant male will indeed, if it can dominate, fertilize most of the eggs. But in this condition here, with, where, where competition is low, you can see that small males now have a significantly higher proportion of eggs that they can fertilize. And you can imagine that part of this, of this variation or maintaining variation is probably selection is not always stable. It can fluctuate depending on whether these, these egg laying sites are abundant or, or limiting. And that might actually give a small males uh, also a chance to, to achieve some fitness. <clears throat> Just the last piece of result I want to show you before I, uh, I uh, um, um, let um, so leave some room for, for the discussion is, is this. So you can see here, we looked at several microvilia species. And in this graph, you will see microvilia longipus is here. And it's the only one that has this massive exaggeration of, of the size of the leg. There's a lot of variation of how these legs look. In this species here, there are um, teeth in the third leg of the male. Whereas in this species here, the males don't have any necessary, uh, necessarily any different patterns or, or morphologies. What you see here, these are all to scale. These are scaling relationship of male and female third legs. And you see an interesting pattern here where there are some species that I'm highlighting here that have large body size, but only Longipes has a large, uh, high variation in, in, in body size. The only species that has also high variation in body size in this one here, but this one has a very small body size. The sample size here is, is anecdotal, so I can't really conclude this, but it seems almost tempting to um, suggest that you need both high variation and big body size for this trait exaggeration to evolve. But this is uh, really speculative at this point. So we wanted to see which genes affect this allometry. And here you see the distribution of, of, of male and female um, body, uh, leg length to body size. So here is, is the size of the third leg and in this axis is the body length. And the males have um, longer legs, uh, but also these legs, you see the coefficient here, 3.7, they are hyperlometric. 
We found the genes, the gene through the comparative transcriptomics called BMP11 or GDF11. And when you inactivate it, you basically uh, affect two aspects. You affect body size. So males have significantly smaller body size uh, compared to the controls here. And you also affect the uh, uh, allometric coefficient. So you, we reduce the allometric coefficients quite significantly. And this means that the effect of this gene is higher in bigger individuals than in smaller individuals. What's interesting is that in the females, we also affect body size. So females will tend to have smaller body size if we inactivate GDF11, but their allometric coefficient is, 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 not, is not affected. So that was very interesting. When you compare that, then you have a species here. This is uh, another species where you can see what by inactivating this gene, we move uh, the distribution or the scaling relationship from uh, in, in microvilli longipes towards this other species with this where this phenotype didn't, didn't evolve. So in this species here, where we don't have um, um, hyperallometric scaling relationship, we have these teeth in the male. And this, the same gene, it does not affect the, the allometry and that you see it here, although the, the sample size is pretty small. But what's interesting, it actually affects a discrete phenotype. So we lose or we reduce quite significantly the teeth. This is, this is a control and this is a, a GDF RNAi animal. And we also have smaller legs. But what you see here also is that in the control, you have um, a larger body size compared to the GDF RNAi animals. It's almost non-overlapping. Non so it means that this gene has probably been um, involved in increasing body size uh, throughout this, this lineage. But in this particular species, it acquired a new function, which is increasing dramatically uh, the size of the leg in relation with the, with the, size, with the size of the body. So do we have a correlation between the weapon which is the leg and its use. And this is another very striking result to us. If you look at how control animals evolve in this, in this video here. So here you have a female, you have a ma males interested in, in this floater, and then the males immediately start to kick each other with the third leg and, and do this stereotypical behavior. Whereas here, when we knock down the gene, there's a female hiding inside there, and there are five males all of them want to mate with the female, but you will notice these males are not paying at all attention to each other. They're not fighting. They're all um, going to, to try to, to mate with the female. So we quantified this, and what we realized is that when we knock down this gene, we have a dramatic decrease in the fighting behavior of these males. So they all switch from trying to dominate to actually ignoring each other and focusing on, on the female. So this is, um, to close the, the, the talk here, this is another example where you have genes throughout um, the, the lineage where they can do completely different function in different contexts. Here in this example, you have six specific differences between males and the females. Some of them are quantitative, some of them are qualitative, and the gene can actually uh, interchangeably affect these in, in different, different lineages. Sorry for uh, taking too long. I just want to um, thank the people who actually did the work. So the people in pictures um, are the ones who uh, uh, generated most of the data I showed today. And a lot of people from the lab also contributed. I would like to thank you also for your attention and for the invitation. And I hope there's some uh, time left for the questions. Thank you very much. That was very, very interesting. Um, we do have a few questions coming in. Uh, the first one is, do you think ectopic expression of geisha in Strudivelia would be enough to promote fan growth? That's a really important question and would be an exciting experiment to do. Uh, technically, today, we cannot do it. Uh, at least not this way, but we're working on it. So we need the CRISPR-Cas9 to, to, to work. And we are working really hard to get it to work. Do I think it can? I have no idea. I think it's possible. I think the experiment is relevant uh, regardless of what the outcome is, because if it can, that means all you need is to add a couple of player in a network of G network that has already been there in that context, already operating, 
and then you can actually just add a couple of players and change dramatically the outcome of the phenotype. If the, if the result is no, that means that this is a gradual, um, a gradual process where you need many, many more other players. So, I mean, in my talk, and I apologize if, 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 if I gave the impression that one gene can do a lot of things. When I talk about those genes, they are obviously part of a big network. We can disrupt them and change things, but that doesn't mean that one gene alone is, is able to do this. But we know examples, for example, PAX6, if you put it in a tissue, it will make an eye. Uh, we know example of this. So I, I can tell that I'm dying to do this experiment. Yeah, it'll be very interesting to see the results of that. Um, we have another question asking um, in, in relation to your experiment with the Ragavelia and the surgical removal of the fans. Why do you think the surgically removed fan individuals still had about a 40% rate of making it to the winner buckets when they their legs probably looked more like those of Strudivelia and only very few of those, if any, uh, made it to the winner bucket? That's also another very interesting question. So I, I don't, that's so the fan I think is very important and helps a lot, but obviously uh, I think the genus is something like at least a hundred million years old or something like that. Um, there are many other things. If you look at the morphology of that species it's pretty um, bulky. It has really strong second legs. If you compare them to Studiovilia, Studiovilia have very thin second legs. Aragovilia has very bulky second legs. That means that they are also equipped with some big muscles to move those things. Because imagine, it's the, in, in terms of biomechanics, if you add a nice pad to your paddle, the bigger that pad is, the more force you need to move it. And I think when we remove the fan, still the animals have some um, differences that allows them to cope with this. Uh, they can compensate by increasing stroke frequency uh, and they have the muscles to, to be able to cope with this. So I think, I think the fan is very important, but not the only important thing. Thank you for that. Um, uh, as these insects are called semi-aquatic, do the rowing species spend any time on land? The rowing species don't spend any time on land, to my knowledge, but they tend to spend time on also on some floating objects. So, you'll, you'll, so it depends on species. So, so like, for example, Ragovilia, they are in the middle of the stream. They will stop, uh, mostly females will stop when they lay eggs and they actually um, attach themselves to a, a rock or something and then they the uh, statulae eggs. If you take species like Jerus, Jerus will be on water lilies and floating floating plants. If you put them on land and ask them, so we tried, we wanted to measure speed on land for those species, it's a joke. They are, they are very clumsy, they just jump around and they don't know what to do. They are, they are really specialized in open waters and they use their legs for that, for that purpose. Uh, thank you. Uh, and I was also curious, does sexual dimorphism influence the function of the fan at all, or does it have any effect on locomotory performance in males and females? No, it does not. We actually measured differences between males and females in terms of locomotion, and there is not, uh, at least nothing that we could, we could detect. So in our tests, uh, it was a mixture of males and females, but we did, before we did that, we did all already test to see if there are sex differences and they weren't. So we took out that, that factor. Interesting. Well, thank you very much. I think, unfortunately, this is all the time we have for today. Um, but thank you very much again for accepting our invitation and for your very interesting talk. My pleasure. And thank you for the invitation. Um, for everyone else watching, do join us again on Wednesday next week when Professor, Professor Daniel Bolnick from the University of Connecticut will talk about gain and loss of a costly immune defense. Uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, this talk will take place one hour earlier than the, the usual seminar time, only for the countries that change clocks this upcoming weekend. Uh, until then, have a great week, everyone, and stay safe. Goodbye.